if we look at a carbon 12, we're going to have your protons. There's going to be six of them. And so they are going to be paired up and down. So And overall, this is going to have zero spin or magnetic moment from all of these being paired together. Those are the protons. Carbon-12 also has neutrons, six of them. They also are going to be paired. And we're at zero. So the nuclear spin quantum number for carbon-12 is going to be zero because all of those protons and neutrons are paired up. In hydrogen, we are going to assign it as one half. We are going to assign each neutron as one half, each proton as one half. And so hydrogen is going to have a nuclear spin quantum number of one half. Hydrogen, or heavy hydrogen, the two hydrogen is going to have one neutron and one proton. So it's going to have a spin of one half up, and then neutrons. There is one, and we get one half up as well. This one adds together to give one, and I'm not going to get into the much more complicated ones of the oxygen 17 or chlorine. In this case, we have two possible proton and neutron that can be spinning in different directions. Now, protons and neutrons cannot neutralize each other. The key thing here we're going to look for is that the atom of interest has to have either an odd number of protons, an odd number of neutrons, or both odd. And so in order for something to be NMR active, we need an odd number of protons Hydrogen 1 has an odd number of protons. Heavy hydrogen or deuterium has an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons. Carbon 12 has an even number of protons, even number of neutrons, so it is not NMR active. However, if we make the isotope of carbon, the carbon 13, then you have an odd number of neutrons. Protons stay the same because it's still carbon, but we have an odd number of neutrons, and so it has. Uh, it is NMR active. It has a spin, nuclear spin quantum number of one half. Nitrogen is going to be uh, both odd, and so it can be seen. Oxygen, both even, so it can't be seen unless we do an isotope, etc. Now we have these different spins of the protons and the neutrons, and there can be different allowed spin states, and we can calculate that using. 2i plus 1, where i is equal to our nuclear spin state, the quantum number. one half, so two times one half would be one 
plus one, we're going to get the number of spin states for a hydrogen atom will be two. So any atom that has a nuclear spin state of quantum number one half is going to have two spin states. And we are going to assign those spin states as plus one half and negative one half. Because this hydrogen is going to be spinning, 
and it has a charge, it's going to generate a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is just indicated by the black arrow going through it with the U as our magnetic moment. Because these have magnetic moments, they are going to interact with a magnetic field in different ways. So if we apply a magnetic field, which we're going to label as B sub zero, all of a sudden these two spin states are not the same in energy. We'll get into the energy diagram on the next slide, but this is just to show you that the two spin states outside of a magnetic field are equal in energy. When we put them in a magnetic field, they're going to be different in energy. All of this is stuff that we have gone over before, so hopefully it's not too surprising to you. But you can think of these hydrogens as tiny magnetic, or tiny little magnets. We're going to put them in a magnetic field. And when you put them in a magnetic field, they're going to either want to align with it or opposite it. And we will generate that. So I'm kind of confused. Are you saying, like, when that magnetic field uh, spin up and spin down? Yes. But when you add magnetic field, that's going to totally make sense. They will be different. And I have an energy diagram on the next slide. So, yeah, this is a representation of a bunch of different protons all in different directions. They're completely random for their spin states. But when we put them in a magnetic field, some are going to be aligned with it. Some of them are going to be aligned against it. And those two are going to be different in energy. You're going to have one. The one that's aligned with the magnetic field is going to be lower in energy. If you think about taking a magnet and putting it in a magnetic field, it's going to want to align with the magnetic field. So that's lower in energy. You have to give it a little energy to uh, get it into the higher energy state. In this case, R plus one half is going to be lower in energy. And our minus one half is going to be higher energy. <coughs> well, the real point of the next slide, this is the graph that shows you that they're separating, is to show you the effect of that magnetic field. So we apply a magnetic field to your sample with zero magnetic field, which is indicated over here. Our two spin states are equivalent. And just indicating the two different spin states with either an uh, up arrow or a down arrow now for simplicity. As we apply a magnetic field, the two energies are going to separate out. And so now the one that's aligned with the magnetic field is going to be lower in energy, and the one that is aligned against the magnetic field is going to be higher in energy. The difference between these two energies is going to be the energy we're going to talk about when we talk about spin transitions between the two energy states. The <coughs> x-axis here is increasing magnetic field. <coughs> so let's say that this was a one Tesla magnetic field. The difference in energy at one Tesla is going to be whatever that delta E is. 
as we increase the magnetic field, let's say we go to two Tesla at the next one over, the difference in energy between these two states becomes greater. And so the higher the strength of your magnetic field, the greater the difference between your energy states of the spin transitions. And that will mean that we need different energies of light or photons to get that to be excited. This comes in with the Lamar equation. Your book goes through the derivation of this equation, but we're just going to use it to compare different energies of the uh, protons between the two spin states. So I did all my calculations with a 300 megahertz NMR. So we talk about an NMR being 300 megahertz, but that's actually the frequency of radio waves that it's using. The strength of the magnet itself is going to be measured with the B sub zero, which is going to be in Tesla. So a 300 megahertz NMR B sub zero is 7.05 Tesla. This gamma, in this case, is our magnetogyric ratio. And that is going to be a constant for each type of nucleus. that in, you're going to get We're just trying to figure out the units. The units, yes. Tesla's cancel. And then it's radians over pi. Writing it down, whatever it is. Radians. 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 It's the radians. 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 degrees, and we have a pi here. Yeah. Yeah. So it, well, how does he hook 
Just don't question it, let it happen. So we use the bowl of velocity. I might get it in view, frequency and velocity in a bunch of it. I know it's not going to It's a great thing. learn to accept it. I know, but I feel like they're going to tell me all mine. It's like carving the Alright, so now we're going to talk about the <laughs> Except when it doesn't. <laughs> so energy is equal to a plus the times V. At this point, I should probably make the correction to your notes. Energy is equal to H times C divided by the wavelength which was incorrect in your notes from before the last test, which is why that type of question did not show up on the last test. So it's a ding confusion. So C is equal to lambda times the, or your wavelength light times frequency. So if we were wanting to substitute frequency into this equation, we have to convert this to V is equal to C divided by lambda. So there should have been a constant C in your equation to calculate energy from wavelength. Okay? But I did check my units on this one because it gets a little bit different. So H is your constant. Six. 0.624 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second. We're going to multiply that by 300 megahertz. Hertz equal to one per second. What's that? Is it place constant joules times second? Joules times second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what cancels. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm in megahertz, so I need to convert that to one megahertz is equal to one million hertz. Now, we can cancel the megahertz, we can cancel the hertz with the seconds, since hertz are one per second. So the seconds now cancel, and I'm going to get this out in joules. One point nine eight seven eight times 10 to the negative 25th joules per molecule. Anybody have any frame of reference for that? It's no. right. really small. Let's convert this to kilojoules per mole. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> because I said so. Because if you're talking about molecules, if you have kilojoules per mole, you can compare these to bond strengths and things like that. So we've got. Thousand joules and one kilojoule, one mole. 
absorption of energy. It can't just take any amount of energy and change spins. It has to be exactly the same. And when we do a spin flip and you get the exact same energy or the frequency of the photon equal to the Lamore frequency, we say that this is in resonance. Which is why we call this nuclear magnetic resonance, because you're looking for the resonance, resonance frequencies of the different protons. Essentially what I was trying to do was getting it to be the right frequency for the magnetic field. The magnetic field can drift a little bit, and so every once in a while we have to adjust our frequency to be on that signal that it was looking at. So I was actually looking at the deuterium in the sim sample, and I was getting it to match that, and then that makes it match all along. Yeah. Is omega only six magnets? No. It's so this is a certain number they all? Yes. This is a um, 60 megahertz <coughs> and a bar. Okay. And then the spin, the first one, like before absorption occurs, like if it's turning cold, clockwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if, and so on the one that you crossed off, is that one just completely wrong? Because because the one that you have down here, I'm confused because they look contradictory. Oh, did I? I got the spins matched, right? So that one's going the. If we flip it over, the spins going. I think I did. It's still spinning. Oh, my circle here. The same. Is it supposed to be spinning the opposite direction? Yeah. 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 Y
which is based on the Boltzmann distribution, where you have the, uh, at any given energy, there will be some spin states that are plus and some that are minus. And energy, we are going to relate to the temperature of the sample. So you're going to be comparing uh, the energies with that uh, temperature. So let's take these numbers that we've been working with. Now, in this case, an upper is going to be the number of a number of protons that are in the upper energy, and then the and lower is going to be the number of electric, er, protons that are in the lower energy. Experiments are going to be done at 25 degrees Celsius, which would be 298 degrees Kelvin. So when we calculate this all out, we are going to see that the N upper and the N lower ratio. messed up my numbers when I was doing the calculation in my calculator. Now 0 0.999952 is equivalent to there being 1 million of the spin states in the upper energy spin state for 1 million uh, spin states that are in the lower energy spin state. 
This means that there's a difference in 50 out of 1 million. That are uh, that we are able to observe basically because we can only see this excess. The stronger the magnet, the greater this delta E, the greater the difference in the number of spin states that are going to be in the upper energy and the lower energy, so you actually have more that you can observe at one time. In this case, we're only looking at a very few number. And in the proton, when we're looking at every proton that's helpful with carbon, when you don't have that many to start with, it can be a problem. The one key, though, is as we're exciting these, since we only have 50, you can actually get them all too excited, so they're all flipping back and forth, and you saturate out the signal. It's called saturation. This is actually something we're doing in lab on purpose. In the NMR lab, you're going to be pre-saturating the water signal. So you're going to be getting that water signal super, super excited, so they're just randomly flipping. And what that does is it saturates out the signal and it disappears from the spectrum, which is helpful when we're trying to get rid of a water signal, but not so helpful if you just saturate all their signals up. So you got to be careful with how much energy you give to the system or you're going to get them saturated. Now, the NMR actually does all that for you and calculates the energy. You're not going to be messing with those things. But I want you to know that that is a potential problem, that you can saturate out that signal. Do you guys have a question? How did you know that it was, do you just know that it's out of one million? I had to mess around uh, with my calculator. How did I do that? It's because it's, you can do 1 do minus 1 nine nine nine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Spectrometer. 
the amount of electrons you have will tell you the relative amounts of shielding or deshielding that you have. And that will depend on the functional groups and different things that we'll talk about on Wednesday. The proper term here to use would be diamagnetic anisotropy. When you have a molecule, the, the molecule may have different regions where shielding is going to be greater in one region than in another, and this gives rise to the chemical shift. So the chemical shift means that they're going to have, for every type of proton that you have in a molecule, will have a slightly different magnetic environment. You have a proton that is partially shielded and another one that is very shielded. It's going to take slightly different resonance frequencies to get them to change spin states. And it, we are going to compare those on the chemical shift scale, which is going to be delta is equal to the shift.
So we'll pick up there on Wednesday.